I'm giving three very different lectures. This first lecture is called The Anatomy of the Invisible Hand. On Wednesday, I'm speaking twice. I'm talking about the limits of economics, which will be about macroeconomics. Uh, it's great. I'm going to give a 45-minute lecture on macroeconomics, which is about all that it's worth. Uh, it pretty much covers the whole field. Um, and then my third lecture will be on, on inequality and growth and poverty. And so they're, they're very different on the surface, but actually they're all the same talk. So I want you to keep in the back of your mind as I spend time with you over these three days, three and a half days, why these are the same talk. And the theme that connects them all is that the world is a complicated place. And what's striking to me as an economist is that it's hard to remember that. Sometimes we forget how complicated the world is. Economics can help you understand that complexity, appreciate that complexity, uh, but it has its limits. And that's gonna be my theme across all my talks. Now, the other day, my son and I were trying to decide what to eat and uh, he wanted steak and I wanted something lighter. And uh, we, so we talked it over and we eventually, we couldn't give exactly what we wanted. So we, we compromised, we went to a pizza place. He got a pizza and I got a salad. We both were pretty happy. So that's what we decided. We decided we would have, we'd go to the pizza place. Now when I use the phrase, we decided, we decided, and how would I say that in Hebrew? Somebody help me out. Anachnu? Chalatnu? Nechalatnu? Echlatnu. Anachnu echlatnu. When I say that, you have an idea what that means when I tell you that it was my son and I. Maybe there was an argument. Maybe, maybe one of us said, oh, we got steak last night. Aren't you in the mood for something different? Maybe he said, oh, salad's not good for you. You should be eating more protein. Who knows? But you have an idea when I say, we decided, that what that means, right? We know what that means in language. We decided. Now, if it's a bigger group, let's suppose... The first three or four, let's make it a little more challenging. The first five people over here have to decide what to do during the break. They're thinking, maybe we should take a little, in the afternoon break, you have a little more time. Maybe we should take a run. Maybe we should go for a swim. But they're all friends, and they all want to do something together. And they talk it over, and they realize, well, we've got a few days here. Maybe today we'll swim tomorrow. And they come to a decision, and they decide. We know what that means. Now, as the group gets bigger, we understand that deciding gets harder, right? So what do we do with the big group? Somebody raise your hand, tell me. What do we do with the big group? We vote, typically. Not always, but we, we could have, there's not the, that's not the only way we can decide things as a big group. That's the obvious way that we see in real life. What's another way? We could argue and convince. What else could we do? We could fight, right? I could say, look, we're going for pizza. I've got a gun. We're going for pizza. That's it, right? That's another way things get decided in the real world, through force, right? So there's a lot of different ways, but we're in a large group and we vote, even that statement, oh, we decided, we, we, we put it, the, the expression in English is, we put it to a vote. What does that mean? What does that mean? What? The vote decided, but how do we vote? There are a lot of different ways. We could have a majority, that would be one way. That's the way we normally think. What are some other ways? We could have unanimity. What's unanimity? Everyone has to agree. In America, I don't know how it works in Israel, in America, a jury is 12 people who decide the innocence or guilt of a person after in a trial. It has to be unanimous. They argue with each other. Sometimes it takes 10 minutes. Everybody agrees. Sometimes it takes days to come to decide, okay? So deciding is a complicated thing among a large group of people. It could be unanimity. It could be majority. It could be what we call in, in English a supermajority. What is that? Anybody know? Two thirds, three quarters sometimes, right? What unanimity means, when it has to be unanimous, it means everybody has what? No. Everybody has equal vote in some sense, but everybody has the equal vote to do one thing, which is what? Stop it, veto power, that's the phrase in English. Everybody has a veto, an ability to stop it. So those are the ways we, we use the word we decide and then when we go to the political process, if I say that the Knesset decided something or Congress decided something, we know what that means too. Now, those of us who aren't political science students probably can't explain it very carefully. We know it has something to do with committees and agendas and coalitions. Maybe there's what's called uh, log rolling in English or vote trading or agreements on the side. There's all kinds of things that happen through the political process. But if I say to you, the Knesset decided the other day 
to do this, that, or the other. You all know what that means. We all have an idea of what that means. But there's another kind of decision that takes place in the world that we don't know what it means. It's very complicated. So we decided, my son and I decided to go out for pizza, but who decided that it's okay to use Google as a verb? Who decided, now I don't know what the Hebrew word is in, in, for, to, now, I'm, this is a guess, but I feel very confident about this guess, that there is a single word, bivrit, for searched on the internet. We don't say, I searched on the internet last night, which is four words, searched on the internet. I bet you have a verb that has to do with Google, am I right? Do you say Google? Yes. <laughs> what do you say? To Google. Yeah? Yes or no? True? What? You say Google it, right? To, to SMS is another word, right? You have, you have little shorthands, little phrases to, to help you communicate. And, and who decides that it's okay to say Google as a verb, but it's not okay to use Enron as a noun? Now, how many people know what Enron is? Does anybody know what Enron is? Enron is an American corporation that got involved in a lot of corruption and fraud and basically blew itself up and disappeared. And I'd like to, wouldn't it be nice if I could call a dishonest, immoral person an Enron? Oh, what an Enron, right? It's like a moron, but more complicated, right? With a little bit of subtlety to it. But I can't, I can do that if I want, but what will happen? No one will know what I'm talking about. But why is it that I can use Google, which is a bizarre thing, it's the name of a company, and everybody knows what I'm talking about. And who decided? And in interestingly, the company Google does not like that people use Google as a verb. I have a friend who works at Google, and he tells me if they use Google in a memo, right, as a verb, they get sent back, and they say, fix this, don't say this, right? Now, there are many words in English that come from a corporation's name that have become everyday language. I don't see any around, but an example would be Kleenex. Kleenex is something you blow your nose in. It's a tissue is the actual English word, but a lot of people have come to call it a Kleenex. Now, Kleenex doesn't like you to call it a Kleenex. You'd think they'd like it. It's good advertising, but they don't like it because it means they lose control over the name once it becomes a regular English word. So Google tries to stop the use of the word Google as a verb, but they can't stop it. They cannot stop it. They try, but they have no control over it whatsoever, which is kind of ironic. So what do I call that? What's the verb I use to describe Google becoming a legitimate phrase and word in the English language? You could say, we decided to use Google as the phrase for searched on the internet. But how does that word decided apply in this case compared to the cases we were talking about? In the case of my son and I having dinner, how did we decide? We talked, we had a discussion, we talked back and forth. In this, if we decided in the group, hey, we started 10 minutes late, should we cut this presentation short by 10 minutes or should we go 10 minutes into the break? If we actually had a conversation about that, it would be very different than the conversation we're having and maybe the people running the conference would make that decision, just like in a family. We make a decision about where we go on vacation, say we don't have a vote, literally, too bad. The parents tend to decide, and then the parents deciding is a complicated process. But none of those phrases, none of those examples, none of those situations capture what happens with Google becoming a verb. Why? What's different about Google becoming a verb and the decision that it's okay to do that? And by the way, the New York Times, for example, did not like the word blog. Okay? It sounded blog. Yeah, it's awful. So they had web log for a long time. That was official New York Times policy. They gave up. They can't say web log. You sound like an idiot. Blog. Everybody uses blog. How did that decision take place? It's clearly not the same. No communication took place among the people who want to use the word or who don't like the word or the word meat space. Anybody know what meat space is? Meat space is a word that didn't catch on. You can see it now and then. You'll find it. Meat space is a word to describe this world. There's the world of virtual, the virtual world, things that take place in the cloud, in the internet, like Amazon is in the virtual world. But if you go to a bookstore, that's meat space. That's 
bricks and mortar and real. It's an ugly word, isn't it? Meat space? It sounds horrible. It's M-E-A-T, not M-E-E-T. Meat space. That word didn't catch on. You've never heard of it. It's not a good word. Who decided that meat space is out, but Google is in? Who decided that ruthless, the English word ruthless, what does ruthless mean? Without pity. Ruthless, everybody can use in English, but nobody says Ruth. They used to. They used to say, boy, she has a lot of Ruth, and he's ruthless. Not anymore. You can't say Ruth. Nobody knows what you're talking about. So how does that process take place? What's the decision-making? There's no national conversation. There's no compromise. It just happened without anyone coordinating or managing the decision. It looks like a memo went out. Okay, it's okay to use blog now. It's okay to use Google, but that isn't what happened. We understand something about the process. What's, what do we understand about the process? We understand kind of an obvious thing, which is what? How does that actually happen that Google got used? It's easier. It's easier. So what happens? Somebody, think about it. There had to be somebody. There had to be somebody who used it for the first time. Who was that person? We have no idea, right? Sometimes, by the way, this happens with a joke. A joke, somebody thinks up a joke. Somebody has to invent a joke, but nobody knows who it is. It sweeps through the country. Everybody's telling everyone else the joke, and the, the origin of the joke is mysterious. I'll never forget, I, I'd love to tell you the joke, but since we started late, I'm not gonna tell you, but I once heard a fabulous joke, which I'll, have, I'll tell you at lunch if you'd like. It's a bizarre, strange joke. I heard it on the Johnny Carson show, which is a very long time ago. So this guy comes on, he's a very strange comedian, his name is Pete Barbuti, and he comes on and he tells this joke and the crowd goes nuts. It's an incredibly weird and funny joke. Then two nights later, maybe the next night, a guy comes on the Johnny Carson show and tries to tell the same joke. Why? He didn't hear it on Johnny Carson. He heard it through somebody else and he thought it was funny and he thought, hey, I'm gonna sound funny. And Johnny Carson stopped him and wouldn't let him tell the joke, right? Because it was too late. It had already been told on his show. But that's how jokes spread. Like we say in English, like wildfire. They kind of just move around. And the same is true with great words that get invented, like Google. Nobody knows how they get started. If they're a good word, they stick. And if they're not, they don't stick. And we have a phrase for that. We call it, really, it's word ironically, word of mouth in English. We'd say, it spreads by word of mouth, meaning and one person tells another, but think about it. Nobody says, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if there were word for describing search on the internet? What do you think, Google? What, that's that's kind of good. Google? That's weird. It's the company's name. Now let's try it. And they start telling their friends. That's not what happens. Some, it just kind of happens. So it's not literally the way word of mouth is like, oh, I found a great restaurant, which is how word of mouth often works. Now, the English language, and Hebrew, of course, is a very unusual case of a language, right? Modern Hebrew was, to some extent, invented, right? Written down, created, planned, managed, but not modern Hebrew today. Modern Hebrew today is like English today. It's alive. It's organic. It is, things emerge, die. Think about how strange it is. There's some great things about English. Here's, a, here's one. Do not becomes don't. That's more efficient. Save a, save a letter in a space, right? It's great. You have to add a little thing, but it's, it's pretty good. But then you have debt. D-E-B-T. That's a, clearly an error. It should be spelled D-E-T. Debt. You don't need the B. The B is a waste. You'd think you, if it were a committee, if a committee were in charge of English, they'd have a vote. They'd get rid of B in the word debt. It would be debt. D-E-T. There are all kinds of things in English, as you know, as if you're not a native English speaker, that are very annoying. The, the nouns are very irregular, extremely irregular, right? How about flammable and inflammable? Flammable and inflammable means the same thing. They both can catch on fire. Those should be two different things. That's a terrible decision. But we decided that flammable and inflammable are the same word, and it hasn't been changed yet. Maybe someday it'll change. Here's another strange thing about English that Hebrew is better at. Pronouns. Pronouns are inefficient, right? Why do I have to say, I went to the store? It should be, went to the store, right? Like in Hebrew. Pronouns are inefficient, but pronouns are dying in English. 
just like they're already dead in Hebrew, right? You say in an email, just wanted to let you know, right? You don't say, I just wanted to let you know. You're in a hurry. You say, just wanted to let you know. And a lot of people don't like that. They don't like how the email process and, and messaging is corrupting, they say, corrupting English. But of course, English is alive. You can't stop it. They're going to be LOL and other kinds of things are going to enter the English language, whether traditionalists want them to enter or not. So maybe, so punch bottom line on English. It's pretty good. It works even though no one's planning it. New words come along that are useful. Words that aren't so useful die out. And you'd think, well, maybe it would be better to have a committee that would actually decide what is good English and what is not. But then you start to think, how would that committee work? Who would be on it? How would they get information about what are good words and what are not good words? How would they spread their decisions? How would they be listened to? No one would listen to them. Now, French, French has a committee. French is my favorite thing. The French has the Académie Française, the French Academy, which has 40 people on it. Any, anybody here speak French? Okay. Now, the members of the Academy are called, you're going to say it better than I can. You're going to say it better than I can. No, you're not going to try it. Can I have a French-speaking person to volunteer here? <laughs> anyway, I'll, let me butcher it. It's, they're called les immortels. Les immortels. Les immortels, of course. <laughs> now, which means, which means, just like it sounds in English, the immortals. That's a modest name for a, gr uh, for a person on a group, right? Uh, what should we call ourselves? How about the immortals? That's, uh, you know, humble. Right? The Immortals. Can you believe? That's the greatest name. But here's what's great about it. They are in charge of the most beautiful language in the world, French. It's a big responsibility. They think they're in charge, but of course they're not in charge. So they don't like what French people use to describe Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday in France is called what? Le Weekend. That's an American word. That's disgusting. It's de goût. It's, how do you say disgusting? It's disgusting. It's an American word. We should have our own French word. Fin de semaine. End of the week. That's Friday and Saturday. That's Saturday and Sunday. Not le weekend. But every French person. And in fact, there's a movie coming out called Le Weekend. It's humiliating to the immortals. They're very upset about it. So who is in charge of the language of English? Who's in charge of the language of French? Not the immortals. Not the Académie Française. We're in charge. We decide what's good English. We decide what's good French. But what does that mean? It's not the same process. We don't have a word to describe the process by which languages emerge and evolve. It's not a random process. It has a feeling of being designed or managed, but it is not designed or managed. If you don't like it, you don't like the weekend, too bad. You don't like Google? Too bad. Who do you complain to? Think about that. You don't like the weekend? Complain to us? There's nobody to complain to. We're left with a paradoxical conclusion. No one is in charge of English, yet somehow we are all in charge. We decide what is good English and what is not. And the mechanism by which we decide is unmanaged, unpredictable, and a bit opaque, unclear. But at the same time, it's not random. English has an orderliness to it that while not perfect, makes some sense. So I want to take another example. That's just a fun example of something that's alive, works pretty well, not great, but pretty well, pretty functional despite a lack of central command and control. But now let's take a more interesting example. Let's suppose a few hundred million Chinese people living in the countryside decide to move to the cities. I want you to think for a minute about the economic chaos that that should create, not just in China, but around the world, right? Because people who live in the countryside live very different lives than people who live in the city. And just to take two obvious examples, I'm gonna focus on one, there are gonna be a lot more bicycles, right? We need a lot more bicycles and we need a lot more pencils because a lot of kids who are in the countryside are now gonna be in the city, they're probably gonna more likely go to school. I'm not sure that's entirely true, but play with, with the example. So we have a sudden enormous change. 
hundreds of, it's not a thousand, not 10, not a hundred, millions, not millions, not tens, hundreds of millions of people changing their lifestyle and putting tremendous pressure on the world's demand for bicycles and pencils. And a hundred other things too, but we're gonna focus on pencils. Now I want you to think about what should happen that you'd predict. You would predict that if a hundred, more than a hundred, if 300, say, million Chinese went into the cities and their kids started going into the schools, you wouldn't be able to get pencils anywhere. There'd be a pencil shortage. All of you'd go to the store. In America, we go into a store called Staples. I don't know where you shop for pencils here in the United States. We go to Staples. I mean, in Israel, in America, we go to uh, Staples or CVS or to Walmart, and we go to get a pencil. They'd say, are you kidding? All the pencils went to China this year. They didn't even read about it. They have 300 million people in the cities. But that isn't what happens. Somehow, even after 300 million people go into the city, their pencils are around. And I said it's a hypothetical experiment, but it's a real experiment because it's been happening. Have you noticed it? Have you noticed it in your lives that 300 million or so people in the last 10, 20 years have changed their lives and put an enormous change in the world demand for bicycles and pencils and 100, 100 other products? Do you say, gosh, you know, I'd like to get a bicycle, but, you know, sorry, there are only 100 available this year for Israel because most of them went to China. It doesn't happen. So it's an incredible thing, and you could spend an entire, not seminar, an entire year, year, looking deeply into that process of how could it possibly be, because you know there's no pencils are. You know there's no bicycles are. You know there's nobody in charge of pencils and bicycles around the world. There's nobody in charge of wood. How can they, how can they make, get the wood to make the pencils? Now, when you think about it, different ways that you could solve this problem of there's not going to be enough wood to go around now that we have to make a lot more pencils. Well, think about what we would do, what different ways we could do that. We could say, well, I guess we'd like to have 300 million more pencils, or maybe 600 million, because each family has one and a half or so, two kids in China, they're going to school. We need, let's say, 500 million pencils. We need 500 million more pencils. Unfortunately, you can't grow trees overnight, so what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to take wood away from some people and give it to the pencil users. That's one thing we could do. We could say, well, we're, the people in China haven't had pencils before, so the people in the rest of the world have to give, go without. We're not going to make more pencils. We're going to take away pencils from people who already have them so that people in China can have them. Or we could do a compromise, a little of everything, a few more pencils, a few less a little less furniture so we free up wood. Right? We can think of all the millions of ways to solve the problem that when people in China want pencils, what do we do? we got a crisis. It's a crisis that we never, ever see. Why not? Because something is going along underneath the, th the world. Something's going on behind the scenes. And it's a very amazing thing that solves this problem. Now, if we wanted to solve it well, what would we do? And you think about this for a minute. Let's put all the people in a room who are affected by the Chinese wanting a lot more pencils. How many people would be in that room? Billions. Billions of people. And we would go around the room and say, okay, could you, do you use pencil? How many people here use a pencil? Okay. Sarah Leia, you use a pencil. Now, could, could, you, could you go without this year? Just this, yeah, let's say eight months. Could you go eight months without a pencil? What would you have to do? Uh, buy something else, possibly. What would it be? A uh, pen. Okay, pen. Do you like using a pen? Well, it's not as good an eraser. So you want a pencil. How, would, how, could you think you could, right? And I have to do this for everybody. Now, what's your name? Altida. What is it? Altida. Altida. You actually love uh, wood furniture, and you have a deck, and you want to expand and ha your deck, and you want some more furniture for your deck. Could you, could you go without so that Sarah Larry could have her pencil? You think about that? You think about that discussion we need to have with about a billion people. And then what are we going to do? We're going to have a vote over the different options, whether we're going to add more pencils, take away furniture, go with, get into more, we're going to need more pens also. Got to get the pen manufacturers, the pen users. How could that possibly happen? Well, it can't. You couldn't do that in a decision way like talking about it. So what is it actually happens, which is mind-boggling? Somehow, somehow enough pencils get created so that every single person in the world who wants a pencil can still get one. It's amazing. And Hayek, the great economist, called it a marvel. And we could spend a lot, I wish we could spend more time. If you're interested, I've written a very nice 
simple, I don't know if it's nice, it's simple, that's what's nice about it, supply and demand analysis of this, you can see what Hayek talks about in his article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, which is about this marvel. And what you can see, if you look carefully, and if you're an econ major, you can read it, what you can see is that what is happening out in the world that makes it so that it's not a crisis is that prices are like feedback loops that send information. And they take all the different information that people might use and want to use if we were going to actually make the decision as a group, and it, the prices help that information to get used in what combination of stuff is going to happen to deal with this crisis. And I just said that. It, it doesn't make any sense. I know that you can't understand that. It's a wild and ridiculous idea. Let me try to say it again. Here's the ridiculous idea. Inside the heads of the two billion people who were affected by this, the people who like furniture, the people who like pens, the people who like anything that uses wood, anything that uses graphite, the center of the pencil, if all those people were in a big room and we could get all the information from them that we wanted, including asking the people who grow cedar, the wood that's used in a pencil, how hard would it be for you to expand by 15%? How long would it take you to grow more wood? How about graphite? Can you dig a little bit more up out of the ground? If I asked that question of every single person who mattered, and I took the answers to that, and I processed them in some way to come to a compromised decision, I could come up with some kind of decision that would actually make sense, and no one does that. There's no committee, there's nobody in charge, there's no expert, and yet somehow that information gets used by what's called a market. And that word, a market, to describe this magical, seemingly magical way that information gets used is not the right word. But we don't have a better word. Because a market means like the stock market, it means like the farmer's market where you can buy produce and fruit and vegetables. But what's really going on with the market is something much more complicated. And I don't like the word, but I don't get to choose it. <laughs> it's not in my control. I'm like Google, I can't, I wish there were a different word, but that's the word we have. Okay. We didn't have a war. The Chinese didn't take over the pencil world. They didn't, t uh, they didn't confiscate the cedar trees to make sure they'd get enough. Somehow, a peaceful allocation of pencils occurred despite the fact that there's a sudden change. No one person answered and solved the problem. There was no committee. We decided, we decided how the pencil crisis would get solved, but it's not decided in the normal way we think of the word. So let's st step back and see what we've learned. I think I have about 10 minutes. There are things in this world that are orderly because they are part of nature or God, depending on your perspective, that have nothing to do with human beings, nothing to do with human beings. So when the earth goes around the sun, we don't have to have an agreement that we're all going to lean a little bit to make sure that we make the turn, right? Everybody understands that we have nothing to do with the orbit of the earth around the sun. It, it's very orderly. It happens every year. We get the seasons, right? It's an incredible thing. It has nothing to do with us. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that we do, that we have intention, we have a plan, we have conscious decision making, we execute the plan. That would be things like doing the dishes, right? How many people have roommates? Raise your hand. Okay, now when you have a roommate, there's often a problem with the dishes in the sink. And as you know, dishes don't do themselves. It would be great if they did, but they don't do themselves. You have to say, I'm going to now do the dishes, and then you do them. That's another enormous category of things in life. Somebody planted it, and it happened. Sometimes that's a good thing. Oh, look, I open my door one morning, and there's a fresh loaf of bread. I don't say, oh, that's like the earth going around the sun. What a great thing, right? I want to thank someone when I see loaf of bread on my, on my porch. And if I see garbage on my porch, I, I, I want to be mad at someone. But when it rains, I don't get mad at anybody, right? Because there's nobody to get mad at. We all understand that. So there's a bunch of things that have to do with human decisions and actions. 
Those are things like baking bread, dumping garbage, doing the dishes. I come home one day, the music's really loud in the house. What do I do if I think it's too loud? I turn it down. There's a knob. I turn it down. How do you turn down the traffic? Think about that. How do you turn down the traffic? There's no knob. But we think there's a knob, right? We think there's a knob because we are always in this other world, the garbage world, the dishes world, the bakery bread world, where we want a knob. So what's the knob for traffic? It's easy. What do we do to fix traffic in America? Or I'm sure it's here too. We build another road. We add a train. What could be more obvious that a train is going to reduce traffic? There's a certain number of people on the road. You build the train, and then some people who are on the road are now in the train. So what happens to traffic? It goes down. Does it work? It doesn't work. Not in America. I don't know how it works here. We widen roads all the time, build roads all the time. Does it solve the traffic problem? Not at all. So there's something else going on there under the surface that's not like, if you do the dishes, think about this. If you, I'm going to get this guy. <laughs> you ever see, uh, <laughs> there's a great movie. There's a great movie. Uh, if you ever see the movie Yojimbo, there's a great fly scene. But, um, uh, that's another story. So you can't turn down the traffic. So the logic, think of the logic. If I have a pile of dishes, I have 20 dishes. If I do one, how many are left? 19. Why does the traffic work like that? It doesn't. Because traffic is part of what I'm trying to call today, I've called it a market. It's really what I would call emergent order, emergent order, organic systems, things that are connected in non-obvious ways to each other. I'll give you a few of them. And by the way, these type of processes that we're talking about, so we have processes that humans are not involved in, the seasons, rain. We have processes that humans are involved in, that involve planning and execution, doing the dishes. What we're talking about is a different kind of process. We don't have a good name for it, but it's an emergent, invisible hand kind of process. And these are things that are human action. They're caused by humans, but they're not designed by a person. They don't have intention. They're very weird. We don't think about those things naturally. And I'll give you a very important example. We use this phrase all the time in the United States. I'm sure you use it here too. Oh, the government wanted to do X, so they passed legislation Y. Right? Oh, why do we have this uh, special law about cigarettes in the United States? Oh, the government wanted to help the children. But there is no entity with conscious motives called the government. There's 535 legislators in America, in the Congress. They each have their own agenda. They're all pursuing a bunch of stuff, and they decide, sometimes formally, through a process of voting in committees and agendas, but the whole thing is a big, complicated stew, right, of special interests. And a lot of times what they decide isn't what they say was their motivation. It's much more complicated. But we like the idea of there being a person, because that's a natural intuition. Just like we want to say, we decided to use Google, but it's not the same process. Okay. In conclusion, then we're going to have a quiz. Not really, but it's close to a quiz. It's really fun. You're going to like it. So what I'm saying here is that many problems solve themselves. They're not like dishes. They're not like the leaves in your front yard. The leaves in your front yard, they will eventually blow away into your neighbor's yard, but they don't pile themselves up neatly by themselves. You have to rake the, the lawn. You have to do the dishes. You don't have to panic about the fact that the Chinese are moving into the city. Hey, we, whoa, we've got to do something. We've got to have a commit. No, it solves itself. That's a miraculous, extraordinary, wonderful, glorious thing. But not every problem that's social solves itself. So I'm not saying, oh, so we just leave everything alone and it turns out great. That's the invisible hand. No, because there are many times the invisible hand doesn't work well because the feedback loops of the prices and the profits and the losses are not there for reasons we can talk about another time. But an obvious example is pollution. It's, it's an, the, the natural thing to happen is that people want to dump their garbage in somebody else's lawn, not in their own lawn. That incentive is not a good one. But if I can make money, Providing more cedar, 
When it's scarce, that's a good feedback loop, right? If I can work harder because I see there's a chance to make more pencils and make more profit, that's a good feedback loop. So some feedback loops work well and some are not so good. And in the case of the English language or the Hebrew language, the feedback loops are extremely weak. So the language kind of bumps along. It doesn't do a perfect job, but it's, it's pretty good. By the way, when I say that things happen without anybody planning them, that doesn't mean there isn't planning in the system. There's lots of planning taking place at the individual and at the firm level, the company level, but there's no global plan to coordinate all the different pieces of the puzzle. So there's planning, but it's not done from the top down. It's done from the bottom up. What I want you to understand is that there are processes out there in the world that come from human beings that are not designed, but look like when they're done, like they're orderly. They are things like language. They are things like the price of pencils. They are things like the noise in the dining room last night. While we're sitting having dinner last night, there's a certain level of noise, and I'm older than you, and it's sometimes I don't hear so well. And if I had to get up and say, you know, I'm, I'm having a little trouble hearing. Can everybody talk a little more quietly? What would happen? Nothing. <laughs> For about 15 seconds, people would, would be a little quieter. Then the natural noise level would start to rise, and it would reach some kind of bizarre equilibrium that no one wants it to be. We decide what the level of noise is, but it's not planned by anybody. Traffic is another emergent system. Language, the politeness of Israeli culture is emergent. Nobody's in charge of it. I actually went to a meeting in my, ha in my neighborhood in Maryland where someone came, out, came out, called a meeting of people and they said, look, he, is, Israelis, it would be great if Israel's culture was a little more polite. So let's fix it. Oh, really? Interesting. How would you do that? We're going to put up billboards. Are you crazy? <laughs> right? As an economist, I look at that and I think this is sad. This isn't a great, I mean, it'd be nice if Israel were more polite or America were more polite. It's lovely. Right? And in certain dimensions, I'm sure Israel is more polite. Now, I will say as, an, as a true statement, I think, when I'm in a store in Israel today, I was here in 1971. In 1971, people were really rude to you in the store. They're nicer now. I think there's a reason for it. We, that's another conversation. But things do change. We're not saying it's fixed by, by you know, things you can't control. Things are alive, right? They respond to all kinds of complicated incentives. They're connected in all kinds of complicated ways. And if you try to steer them, you're going to have a tough time. And we are, you know, Omar Moab's speech last night was full of examples where things that I thought I saw the connection. I mean, what would be more logical than saying, if I think rents are too high, I should just pass a law and low rents? That seems like a great idea, but it's more complicated than that. So, lessons. Fixing things in these complicated systems sometimes lead to unintended consequences. You cannot turn down the traffic by building a railroad. You might have an impact. It might be a good idea, by the way. It's not to say that building a railroad is a bad idea. It's just to say that it doesn't, quote, solve the traffic problem. The world is a complicated place. The economy is more like a garden than, the, than an engine. So I want to close with a few puzzles for you to chew on. I'd like you to write these down. We've got about seven minutes here, I think before we open it up to conversation. I think I'm going to do a little experiment here. Okay? I'm going to give you these puzzles. I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to stop here. We're going to have a conversation. I'm going to leave five minutes to the end, at the end. And at the end, I'm going to give you these puzzles. And we'll break up into little groups of four, and I'll see if you can come up with the answer, okay? And Ezra's group could have an advantage. Uh, Ezra's my son. Uh, I know he knows the answer to one of the four puzzles, and that could be of assistance, so you might want to decide where you make the break point over there. But let me, <laughs> let me, let me stop here, and, and I want to open it up for conversation. And when, when I say conversation, my preference is not that you ask me questions and I, we take turns of me answering them. I like, if possible, you to discuss what I've talked about among yourselves, okay? So I'm gonna, I would rather be a facilitator. Might not work. Might just be more like a press conference, all right? <laughs> but I prefer it to be more like a moderated conversation. So who wants to start us off? Yeah. Uh, um, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. 
first of all, I like the, the example of the, the, the linguistic example. And I think that they, uh, in Israel we have a great example of it that you can uh, make a great use of. There is an academy of linguistics in Israel, uh, and it does actually wrote an article about it, and it does, it does try to regulate the market and, and the sense of, um, of creating new words like Google. Right. But if you, you can check it, you can check it out, and the words are so, are so out of, out of, the minute they get out, they're out, they're out of date, and that's uh, the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is they have nothing to do with the... Uh, right. The and nobody so, uses them. Yeah. yeah, so if you take that as an example, you can learn a lot of how it, it tries to, 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 to imitate the market and fails to. So it, it, I just have to mention, because it's such an incredible story, there's an amazing book written by Simon Winchester called The Professor and the Madman. Anybody read that book by any chance? So the professor is uh, Professor Murray. Professor Murray is a, um, a linguistic expert of, of, in England in, uh, in, I think, the 19th century. And this is how the book opens, okay? So Professor Murray is in charge of the greatest language project of all time, the Oxford English Dictionary. The Oxford English Dictionary is Talmudic. It's you know, this big. You can get a one-volume version. They give you a, micro, a, mic, a magnifying glass to read it. Now it's available online. But it's an incredible achievement because he, what he wanted to do was to find every single word in the English language, define it, and find the first use of it in print. It's an impossible task. So what did he do? He crowdsourced it, which is a great word, by the way, that didn't exist eight years ago, to crowdsource, right? We all know what that word means, right? Do we know what it means? Is there a Hebrew equivalent? Crowdsource means to get a whole bunch of people working together, again, without a boss or coordinator, to solve a problem. So a, to, a crowdsource problem solving would be, I just put up on my blog, I'm going to Israel, um, give me some recommendations for, ex for, for restaurants in, in, in Jerusalem. And a bunch of people would tell me, some people would argue back and forth, and then I'd have an answer to where I should eat, right? That's crowdsourcing. So Wikipedia is the greatest crowdsourcing project of our era, right? There's, there's no editor. There are sort of editors of different parts, but a lot of it just happens. And by the way, economists who are brilliant are totally wrong about Wikipedia. They would have said, if you'd asked before Wikipedia, could Wikipedia exist? They'd say, no, of course not. There's no incentives, there's no profit. It's gonna be awful, it'll be terrible. It won't be as good as an Encyclopedia Britannica, which has you know, real experts and, well, Wikipedia I think is much better than Encyclopedia Britannica. One reason is, it's alive, right? It changes, it corrects mistakes very quickly because it's crowdsourced. So Mr. Murray, Professor Murray, realizes that he can't by himself, and even with the staff, find all the first time that English language words are used. So he asks the world, send me a postcard, send me a letter every time you can find a, a version of a word that's old. So he gets all these postcards and letters, and, and some of them don't agree, and he, they get corrected. Older, older ones get established. And he has one man who has produced more of the answers, more of the origins of the words than any other contributor. Hundreds and hundreds of words have come from one person. He's very, he wants to meet this man. This takes place over decades. So the book opens with him going to visit. He, they, make, they finally agree to a time. And uh, Murray goes to meet this man. And he pulls, he gets the address. And he pulls up to the long, beautiful driveway. There's a huge mansion. And he goes to the front, it goes into the front door and there's a distinguished looking gentleman there and he shakes his hand and says, it's great to meet you, Mr. I forget his name, Mr. So-and-so, you've been such a great help to me. And the man at the front desk says, uh, well, you must be, I'm sorry to, to let you know, but I'm not so Mr. So-and-so. Mr. So-and-so is here, but I'm not him. And this is a, uh, a house for the insane. And he is here as a patient and has been here for many years. So here's this guy who's been getting everything by letter, and it turns out that the man who has been his greatest help is clinically insane, and his, the reason he can't come to visit him is that they don't let him out. That's the first three pages of the book. The rest of it's even more fantastic.
But the thing that I want to tell you that's so bizarre is it took decades to get A, B, and a few letters out of the dictionary. And by the time those volumes came out, they were totally out of date, even in, 18, in the 1800s. Today, it's, it's ridiculous how many words are getting constantly created. So anyway, sorry. I just, it's, it's an incredible book. It's, uh, sorry to go off on that tangent, but yeah. Any uh, other comments or questions? Yeah. You spoke about the changes that occur and you connect to last night maybe for a second. You spoke about how there are inefficiencies in the government, um, which is easy to touch on and saying, why does that happen? But a bridge to a different area. What, most of us are in school. Almost all of us are in school now. We're teaching. And I think that a lot of times we're going to do an introduction to microeconomics and macroeconomics. And I feel that through the textbook and professor, I don't feel that this feeling of change and the differences and even in more advanced courses that this is what's touched on. Is there a reason why our classes stay a little more archaic than changing? I guess I have to answer that, don't I? Um, I um, let me try to answer that in, a, in an unusual way. There's a simple answer and there's a complicated answer. The simple answer is the incentives to be a great professor are not so great. That's the facts, right? That's just a fact. Why that's true, why the feedback loops for academic life are what they are, is not easily answered. It's a complicated set of, of institutions, norms, culture, power, subsidies, right? I think the world will be very different. I don't know how it works in Israel, but in America, the students are not the most important source of revenue. The government is. So that changes everything, right? That changes everything. And, and you shouldn't be surprised that, that changes everything. Some of it's good. There's many good things about that, by the way, right? It's not, but it's not so good for the students, right? At a, at a great American university, the teachers don't pay as much attention to the students as they do to their own research, because that's where the rewards are. When I was at UCLA, um, and I used to talk about how much I love teaching, my colleagues laughed at me. They made fun of me. Because they said that was, what are you, wasting your time? That's not, I'm thinking, what are you doing here? <laughs> Don't you feel, I mean, you're corrupt. It's, it's okay to do research, it's fine. But how, how is it that you can sneer? How is it that you can be, laugh at the idea that it's good to teach students? So that's, that's a reality in America, and I think probably somewhat here as well, for a whole bunch of, of, of related reasons. But, but I think it's a little more complicated than that. So let me give a, what I think is a more um, interesting answer. What I talked about today, and I'm going to talk about more over the next two lectures, is what I, call compl is what I called complexity. The fact that things are interconnected in, uh, in complicated and unobvious ways. I was once invited to give a lecture at the um, Council of Economic Advisors, which is the group of economists who work for the president, okay? I was excited, that's fun, right? And I thought, what should I talk about? And I decided I would talk about what I talk about today, which is emergent order, market processes. And it was the, one of the worst lectures I've ever given in terms of how it was received. They all went, oh, I know all that. Yeah, we know that, that's economics. Yeah, markets, markets work, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, I've been thinking about this for 10 years and I still don't understand it. So either I'm really stupid or you don't appreciate how complicated and subtle this idea is. So here's a different way to think about it. I once interviewed a mathematician who talked about randomness. What's, how do you say randomness, Bivarit? Akrai? Okay, randomness. You can define randomness, right? You can define what it is. I can teach you the definition, then I can ask you on a test, which of these is a good definition of randomness? But if you know the definition of randomness, do you understand randomness? Randomness is a really deep, complicated idea. And he said, you could spend your whole life thinking about randomness, and you'll never fully understand it. Nassim Taleb, who's one of my favorite writers, and if you haven't read his book, this quote from him, is appropriate, but it's also nice that he wrote a book called Fooled by Randomness, which I think is his best book. It's a great, great book, Fooled by Randomness. 
In another of his books, he says, he quotes a proverb from Venice. The proverb is, the farther you are from the shore, the deeper the water. What does that mean? The farther you are from the shore, the deeper the water. Meaning the more you go into a subject, the more you, the, you think you're making progress, you're getting toward your answer, there's so much underneath that's more complicated. So randomness is an idea like that. The more you think about it, the more you understand it, the more you appreciate it. And I think economics properly taught and understood is the same way, particularly the concept I'm talking about today, which is complexity. It's a very deep idea. And the more you think about it, the more you understand how rich and nuanced it is and how it isn't reduced to mathematics. It can't be reduced to mathematics, just like randomness. You can, you can write a, a mathematical formula to generate random numbers, but that's not randomness. I mean, there, there might be random numbers, but it doesn't mean you understand randomness because it's so much more complicated. So one of the reasons I think microeconomics and macroeconomics are so sterile, sterile, meaning they've got no life, they're dry, they're not rich, is partly because we're lazy. We're lazy. My professor taught it to me that way, not Sam. I was, by the way, blessed to be a student of Sam Pelsman. Right? He didn't teach it as a dry mathematical subject. But you take your professor's notes and you go teach like, like your professor did. So one answer is it's custom and it gets sort of ingrained. Two is there's no incentive to change the custom because it's, it's, you can do what's easy. Three, it's hard to do. <laughs> Even if you want to do it better, it's not easy to do better. I just gave you a, an introduction to complexity. What's the exam? Think about this. What's the test? Let's, I, I want to see if you got anything out of the lecture. And I'm gonna, I have my own way. I'm going to show you in a minute. But how would I normally find out if you got anything out of the lecture? A. The, the English language is A. Organic. B. Controlled by a committee. C. Right? That doesn't test whether you got the idea. That's a subtle idea. Multiple. How about this? X, if X equals 7... X plus, I can't give that kind of quiz that has an exact answer. I, I'm stuck with things like, what is the term that I use to describe emergent processes? A, complexity. B, complication. C, complementary, right? Those are the easy exams to grade, and those are the exams we tend to give. And that's a shame. But that's the way the system is designed. And by the way, it's not literally designed. Nobody said, let's have the universities work like this. Universities are an emergent process. A set of incentives are put in place. Customs emerge as a response to those incentives. And now it's getting shaken up a little bit by the internet. The internet is an end around, right? So you, you don't like your microeconomic class? There's 10 more online you can try. Some of them are pretty similar to yours. A lot of them are different, right? So economics is what it is. By the way, we like to think we're scientists. We're not. We're more like art historians, which is embarrassing because we think, you know, we're like physicists. We don't want to think of ourselves as art historians. So that's a big problem, right? So if, how, how many people, are, people here are in a business school? So that's very practical, being in a business school. So people who teach in business schools, they're kind of embarrassed about that, right? Over in the philosophy department, they're trying to figure out the meaning of life. And I'm teaching you accounting, so I'm going to make it very scientific. Can't be too useful. Same way with law. Law school's weird, right? Medical school's even a little weird. They make you learn a bunch of stuff that's not so useful, right? There's a whole bunch of reasons for that too. But anyway, I'm off on a tangent. Next, other, other re reactions or comments? Yeah, I don't know. Um, one of the most commonly heard uh, uh, criticisms of this, uh, this theory is that um, although uh, the, uh, this, this invisible hand um, uh, is like supposed to work in a totally free market. There, there are a lot of distortions, and they are so big that maybe they just destroy the whole idea. For example, uh, you can have like uh, corporations which are very, very big, and they can like they can decide on all, all sorts of things, and even if society doesn't decide it um, through a invisible hand uh, process. Um, what is your um, response to that? So let me give a few more. There's there's corporate power. 
there's imperfect information, there's externalities. Externalities means my actions don't just affect me, they affect other people. That would be the pollution example I gave earlier, that, ha that it definitely corrupts the invisible hands process. It doesn't work so well by itself, right? So then the question is, how important and big are these imperfections? And this is the most important thing I can teach you today, probably. What's the alternative, right? So if you have an alternative process, you want to make sure that the alternative process is better than what we have now, right? So a lot of times what economists do is they say, well, I can't fly, which is unfortunate. The world would be a better place if I could fly. So I'm going to assume I have wings. That'd be a better solution, right? That'd be better. Now, you don't want to do that, right? You don't want to say, if I have, for example, under health care, that we understand that if you are sick, you have an urgency and a, you're vulnerable. We understand that, right? And we understand that in a market of people looking for profit, that might encourage them to do bad things to you when you're sick. It might also make them do good things, right? It's like saying, you're all the time. Well, if the airlines didn't have regulations, they wouldn't be careful about the planes because they have a profit incentive to cut back on maintenance, right? Of course, if they do that, what happens? They kill their customers. Not a good thing. Not, not, that's not good for profits. So they have a, tr a trade-off. Now, the question is, do they make the same trade-off that you would make, right? So that, my cute answer doesn't answer, solve the problem, right? The question still is, will they have an incentive to do the maintenance? Will they do the right amount? Will they do too little? That's still an issue. Then the question would be, but if I put an agency to regulate them, will they then pick the right amount, right? So to take an example, we understand that if I'm selling you drugs, that I have an incentive to sometimes sell you a drug that maybe doesn't work so well because I'm going to make money off you because you can't understand it. You're not a scientist, et cetera. Right? So how do I solve that? How does the, how does the market solve that problem? Information. Information. What? What else? Well, right now, we, in America, and I'm sure you have it here, we have a thing called the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which has to approve all drugs. Is that good or bad? It's good. Why? What's good about it? They're careful. They make people test a lot. How long does it take to test the drug to make sure it's safe? Anybody know in America? About 15, 10 to 15 years. Well, it's really safe. That's good. That's better. Longer is better. Unless what? Unless you're sick. In which case, I want it now. Right? So there's actually a movie out. I haven't seen it yet. Dallas Buyers Club. It got um, Matt McConaughey got best actor. For a guy who said, look, I'm dying of AIDS. And these drugs aren't legal. I'm going to Mexico. I'm bringing them back. And I'm, there are other people like me. We want to try them. It's better than nothing. So the advantage of FDA is it's great. It makes the world safer. The disadvantage of the FDA is it makes the world safer. Think about that. It's a little too safe. They're very cautious. Why are they maybe too cautious? What? Risk aversion. Why would they be risk averse? I'm risk averse too. I want, don't I want them to be safe? Could a drug ever be too safe? Could an airplane ever be too safe? You know what the safest airplane is? One that doesn't take off. That's the, that never crashes. Right? 100% safe. We don't want that airplane. It's weird, right? We want a dangerous airplane. Right? It's a strange thing. We want it to be a little bit dangerous. Right? It's like saying there should be a fine of a million dollars every time they lose a bag. Because a lost luggage is very uh, annoying. But if the fine were a, were a million dollars, what would happen? There'd probably be no luggage. Probably. Right? Which is, has a different cost. Okay. Other... So... So to go back to, to Handel's basic questions, there are a lot of things that are imperfect about leaving things alone. Sometimes it's better to intervene and to have regulation, to have restrictions, to have even government provision. But if you argue for that, you have to think about how government works. Sometimes it works well, sometimes not so well. And so that's the relevant question, which works better? And I would argue that in some things government works better, but not always. And in some places the market works better. And invoking problems with the market but forgetting that political processes have their own flaws is a little bit like pretending that I, if I wanted to fly, I'll just assume I have wings. What economists often do is, oh, we know how to fix this problem. We'll just have this solution. 
The political process never picks that solution, ever, because it often listens to some special interests and doesn't do what the economist thinks is the right thing. So it's a little more complicated. But let's do the, the problems, OK? So here they are. I want you to write them down. And what we're going to do, here, there's four questions. Uh, and you know that, ch that game? Um, uh, it's a children's game on like TV shows. One of these is not like the other, right? So you have like a tree and a bush and grass, and then you have a chicken. And yet one of these is not like the other. It's the chicken, right? Good. So one of these is not like the other. But it, so the challenge is you have to figure out why they're similar. The three that are similar, it's not obvious that any of these are alike because they seem to be very different. But one of them is not like the other. So here are the questions. So the first one comes from a family friend of ours, whose name I won't mention, but Ezra knows this uh, story. This friend of mine loves cats. Uh, when you come to Israel for the first time, and this is true, of course, in many countries outside of America, and it's even true in America, but it's very different in Israel, you notice that there are cats that just wander around outside. I don't know what you call them in Hebrew. We call, in, Eng in, in America, in English, they'd be called feral, F-E-R-A-L, feral cats. It means they're not owned by anybody. They're out living on their own. They're kind of grown-up cats. They're out of the house. It's nice. So in Israel, there are these cats on the, on the street. Anybody like them? Some people like them. Now, and people don't like them. Raise your hand. Now, last night, by the way, poor, poor Omar Moab was trying to give a nice speech. <laughs> And outside this window only was a, um, a terrible cat experience that, uh, you know, I was thinking, I felt bad for him, but that's one reason people don't like him, but they're kind of dirty, people think. So this friend of mine, her vet, her do cat doctor, he said, I have a policy. If you bring me a feral cat, you bring me a cat off the street, I will give it the shots that it needs for free. And my friend said, isn't that beautiful? That way, every time I can bring him a cat, I can get somebody to bring him a cat, there'll be one less feral cat on the street. And, you know, if it catches on, if enough people do that, we'll, we'll, we'll make a real dent. We'll really reduce the, the feral cat population. So the first question is, is that true or false? And, and we can think about it in a literal way. If I bring in a cat, if I bring in a cat and bring it off the street and adopt it and get the shots, what if I reduce the population by one or something different? Okay, so that's the first question. Here's the second question. No, 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 the shots are like, um, we could kill it. That would be a more interesting question, actually. It would make it simpler. But this is, this is somebody who adopts the cat. You have to bring it into your house. And, and, and get the shots, and, and, they'll, and that way there's one less cat on the street. What could be true? Er, what could be, that has to be true. Just arithmetic. So when I give a question like that, it's obviously not true. So you have to start thinking about why would that not be true? It's, it's just arithmetic. Okay, and by the way, in general, if you could answer these questions without economics, your answers are wrong. They might be true, but they're not the interesting answer, right? So the interesting answer is, what is, is there anything related to these questions that I just talked about that would help you answer them? So that's the first question. Does the feral cat population go down by one or something different? Second question, if you care about the environment, hang on, I don't like clarifying questions. They can give away something, so we're just gonna hang on. If you care about the environment and you want there to be more trees, should you use paper towels in the restroom or not? Should you wipe your hands on your pants? So, you know, I love trees. I do. So when I go to, into the men's room and I go to wash my hands afterward and I wipe my hands on my pants instead of using up a paper towel, is that good for trees or bad for trees? That's the second question. Third question. If I become a vegetarian, and people who sat at my table know that I'm not a vegetarian. I went back for seconds on the chicken. If I become a vegetarian, are there going to be more chickens in the world or fewer? Well, it seems obvious that if I stop eating chicken, there should be more chickens. So is that really true? And the last question is, there are a lot of people who like to kill whales for their 
blubber and skin and whatever else they do with whales. Sushi. Is there whale sushi? I don't know. But there are a lot of people who kill whales. And so if, if people stopped using products made from whales, would that increase or decrease the whale population? So you see, they're all somewhat similar, right? They're all questions about how does the population of trees, whales, cats, chickens change in response to um, my change in behavior? And obviously, here's another wrong answer. Well, you're only one person, so it's trivial. You can ignore it. That's not interesting. It could be true, but not a good answer. It doesn't learn anything. That's not, you know, uh, any guest in the hotel could give you that answer. So that can't be the right answer. So we're going to take, I'm going to give you, it is... Two, four, it's a 9.45, so we have, we're going to take 10 minutes in groups. So here's our groups. Four, you 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 Go, go, 10 minutes. See if you can get the right answer. Start arguing. So the idea is that if some people don't want to adopt cats because they have to get all the shots and to get them clean, the shots are to just stop spreading rabies and other awful diseases. So some people, this is to say, let's make it easier for people to adopt. Uh, I think about a bunch of cats starting off by this free service. If we ever do this again, and I ever get invited back, we've got to, this is where the lecture ends, right here, because we don't want the right answers. One of the things that's so fascinating about learning is that you've learned so much more from arguing about this than if I just told you the answers. If I told the answer, you write them down, oh, that's interesting. By arguing about them, you process it in a totally different way. So we'll see you next year. Okay, now, now I want to see how much confidence you have in your answer. How many people think they know which one's not like the other? Pretty confident. Raise your hand. It's a small group. Okay. Now, before, we, before I give my answer, I, before you justify your answer, I just want to hear... I want to hear a number from your group. One, two, three, or four. Which question is different? Two. two. One. Four. Three. Oh, good. We're getting every choice. One. Four. Four. Three. Okay, so now I'm not going to tell you the answer yet. We started 10 minutes late. We get to go at least till 10 minutes after. We're going to, I hope. So here's the question. First, I want to hear. Uh, you said which number? Two. What was? It? Give me a give me a quick sen a few sentence reason. Two sentences. Why? It's neutral. Therefore, it's going to be good or bad. What is the allocation of those two rows coming from? Okay. How many people? All, one. That's an, who said one. Number one. Why do you think one's different? a different kind of problem. Number three. Who said number three? Yeah. Because um, we think all the other three, the natural equilibrium is usually higher, uh, sorry, lower, and this is the only um, option that the equilibrium is higher. Okay. Who said number four? Raise your hand. Yeah, number four. Watch. 
because we think that with uh, the web population, there's um, external intervention. It's what? There's, there's external intervention on a population which, which otherwise would, would be growing. Like, there's external intervention which is decreasing the population, and which isn't the same in the other cases. OK, does anybody want to change their vote for what they had based on those, those four answers? OK, let's try again. Somebody else who wants to make a case for number one. Anybody else? Number, so, yeah, go ahead. You change the nature of the animal. You change the nature of the animals. Who wants to make a different case for number two? Anybody else? Number three. Who else wants to say something about number three? Number three is, is produced resource. It's a produced resource, which is what the chickens. The chickens are produced, so three is different. Who wants to make another, a case for number four? Who didn't make it already? Ezra, the, the whale population would grow. You're not at you're not at a natural equilibrium because there's a bigger external factor. There's a bigger external factor of people killing the whales. Why is that different than people eating chickens? That's a lot of them. <laughs> They're different because the chickens are grown to be to be eaten. Chickens are grown to be eaten. Like Why does that matter? It matters mm -hmm. because, well, okay, we argued about that, but, but we both agreed that the conclusion is that we grow, we grow chickens because there's a demand. If there's no demand, we'll stop growing chickens. But we don't grow whales. Do we grow, do we grow trees? Yes. yes. So trees are something like chickens. That's clear, right? Chick, are, chick, are cats like? No. No, they're different. It seems like... One of the challenges here is that cats look like whales because it's more of a natural thing, and chickens are more like trees, but that's not the answer. So the right answer, you know it's tempting? It's tempting not to tell you, and I can tell you on Wednesday, right? But I think I'll tell you. I think I'll tell you. Or maybe I'll give you a clue. I'll give you a clue. Um, there are about 300 million, a little over 300 million people in America. Again, I don't know the numbers for Israel, but I know the numbers for America. They're over, the, the chicken population of the United States is over a billion, right now. If you could literally count the number of chickens alive in the United States, it's over a billion. Is there any chance that, chi that chickens are an endangered species? None, zero. Why? Whales are endangered. What's the difference? The simple answer is you can make money selling somebody a chicken. You cannot make money selling somebody a whale. Now what's interesting is the tuna are also somewhat at risk and people are raising and farming tuna now in enormous, in the ocean, not in a tank, not in your backyard, right? It's not like a, a tuna veal. They're, they're growing tuna in large, enormous netted areas to try to, make them more like chickens. And if they do that, no matter how big the demand for sushi is, there are not going to be fewer tuna in the world. There are going to be more, right? So the reason there's a billion chickens is because you can make money because people like to eat them. And there are a lot of trees in the world. Why? Because people can make money farming trees. So trees are just like chickens. So there's no difference between, now let me be very clear here. I'm going to give you the, the right answer and then I'm going to give you a counter answer to make sure you see it. If your goal, my wife's a vegetarian, okay? My daughter's a vegetarian. Four of us are meat eaters, or carnivores. <laughs> if your goal in life, if you think it's immoral to eat a chicken, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a very narrow question. The narrow question is what happened, if you only care about maximizing the number of chickens, if you only care about making sure that chickens don't disappear, you should encourage people to do what? Eat chickens, for sure. If you only care about the number of trees in the world because you're worried about carbon dioxide, say, right? What should you do in the bathroom? Use your pants. Yeah, use your pants. I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you, no, sorry. Got confused. Sorry. Use the paper towels. Yeah, use the paper towels. 
waste them. Use too many. Take an extra four or five. Because what will that do? If everybody, if we had a, if we had a, a campaign to take ex, four extra paper towels, what would that do to the number of trees grown in the world? Increases them. Now, if, tree, if paper towels are made from sequoias and redwoods, that's awful. Because they're precious. They are very difficult to create. They're not. Paper towels don't come from redwoods and sequoias. They come from a tree farm. So if you just care about the number of trees, you should waste paper towels, take extra napkins, right? Okay, so cats. If we start taking wild cats off the street, hundreds and hundreds, what happens to the cat population? Not much. Why? Because they have, they don't have more babies. The ones that are left have what? More babies that survive, right? Right now, I, I assumed, I could be wrong, right? Again, these are questions that depend somewhat on the facts, but we're ignoring the facts, right? As long as, as long as the current population of cats is determined by the supply of garbage, which is what I assume keeps them alive, right? If you take hundreds of cats off the street, you don't reduce the population by, hundred, by hundreds, all you do is determine more of the cats out there that are left, their litters, their numbers, or more of them survive. Eventually, you could make a difference, right? But probably the right way to reduce the population of feral cats is what? Better garbage cans, right? That's the right way, right? That's the way to turn down the traffic. The seemingly obvious way, there's no chance I'm calling on you, the seemingly obvious way, you can argue with me later, the seemingly obvious way, we argue about these things from time to time. The seemingly obvious way is to take the cats off the street, but the right way is to reduce the garbage. Yeah. Yes, actually, it'd be much better to give them a disease instead of spaying them. Right? Give them a, a really awful disease. There's a whole bunch of different ways you could. Because Corinne asked, does the shot kill them? That doesn't work. That's not so good. All that. That's no different than keeping them in your house. Spaying them is one way to. That would make no difference either. For until you did enough of them. But would be much better is to give them a disease, or, or when you take your trash out, you put in a birth control pill, right? And the cats that eat the food don't reproduce, right? That, that, and by the way, people, you're, um, you're laughing, but that is actually, they do that to rats. They, do, they try to find ways to reduce rat population. So the right answer, the right answer is number four. The right answer is number four. Because number four is different. Why is number four different? Because the feedback loops aren't there. For the first three, the feedback loops counter affect what you're trying to accomplish. The feedback loop in the cat case is what? The supply of garbage doesn't change. So there's instead of reducing the population, you have an effect of the litters that survive. There are more cats that survive per litter, per, per number of births. In the, in the, tree, in the chicken case, if more people want to eat chick, if fewer people start eating chicken, then chick, the number of chickens is going to fall. Vegetarianism, re, um, excuse me, no, I'm, I'm getting confused again. Sarah Lay, would you help me? No, you're right. If yeah, people, did I get it right? Yeah. Right, so, right. So if fewer people eat chickens, you get, you get fewer chickens, not more. What you normally think is there'd be more surviving chickens. Your intuition is wrong. Your natural intuition is wrong about the first three because there's feedback loops that work to offset what you thought would be the, the effects. But the fourth one is true. If everybody tries to eat whales, we're going to kill them all off because there's no profit feedback loop to protect them unless you can find a way to farm them like they did with tuna. So an endangered species, which is endangered because no one owns them, no one owns the ocean. There's no feedback loop. We have what's called the tragedy of the commons. So the invisible hand doesn't work very well in that situation. 